Welcome to Park Media. I'm your host, Vince Emanuele, and today we are speaking with Oscar Chacon. Oscar is the co-founder and executive director of Alianza Americas, a Chicago-based national network of Latin American immigrant-led and immigrant-serving organizations in the U.S. Chacon is an immigrant from El Salvador and an organizer and leader on community justice struggles at the local, national, and international levels for more than 40 years. He has occupied leadership positions in multiple organizations, including various international solidarity networks in the 1980s, Centro Presente, Oxfam America, the Northern California Coalition for Immigrant and Refugee Rights, and Heartland Alliance for Human Needs and Human Rights. Chacon is a frequent spokesperson domestically and internationally on economic, social, political, and cultural struggles involving Latin American immigrant communities, including the nexus between economic inequality, human mobility, and white supremacy. Alianza America's mission is to improve the quality of life in Latin American immigrant communities in the United States, as well as peoples throughout the Americas. Oscar, thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm grateful for the invitation. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to have you. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey to the United States and what your experiences were, of course, in El Salvador uh, before you came here? Sure, absolutely. Well, I came of age, and by that I mean I turned into my teen years uh, in the mid-1970s. It was a period of time of incredible political upheaval in El Salvador, mainly as a result of decades, if not centuries, of incredible economic political oppression exercised by a basically oligarchical government supported by a military, which disguised itself as a democracy but I learned precisely in 1975 uh, the emptiness of that idea. I was a young uh, student, still in my junior high, when coming from a school, I actually became part of a march that became the target of political repression, not so different than what we have seen lately in the U.S., except that they didn't even bother to pretend that they were going to try to dissolve protest marches peacefully. They just shot people and they did not shot bullets, uh, uh, um, rubber bullets, uh, but instead live ammunition. So I actually very much I witnessed how they dissolved this demonstration by shooting at people. And that particular image, and this demonstration was mainly students. I mean, these were people coming from the national University of El Salvador, who actually, again, I mean, lost their life, many of them, in that particular incident. Uh, from that point forward, it was basically a rapid set of events that took me into becoming much more involved, both as a student and part of the student organizations at the time. But also, at that time, I was a very active member of a Catholic organization known as the uh, um, ecclesiastic-based communities that were very involved in social justice work. So from both of those capacities, I, as I said, I mean, became essentially part of what the government at the time, the military dictatorship, disguised as a democracy, uh, considered to be uh, what would, today we would basically call them terrorist organizations essentially people organizing to try to change those long-standing conditions of economic, social, and political oppression in the country and to bring about a much more equitable uh, way of life and also a more democratic uh, way of life uh, for our nation. In that process, uh, incidents became far more frequent, incidents of violence. I mean, the government sending soldiers and sending police to basically drag people out of their homes I began to lose some of my closest friends who were part of either the student organization or the uh, Catholic youth organization I mentioned. Uh, and my parents figured for my life as I did. And so from one day to the other, pretty much the plan came into place that I should go away uh, from the country. It was the first time ever that I uh, had to go a place uh, by myself. Uh, my parents, my siblings stayed behind. And within a matter of a couple of years, I mean, we all had already reunited in the U.S. essentially as political exiles. Uh, 
from that dictatorial uh, government in El Salvador. So that, those were the circumstances of my first political involvement, but also how that led to the decision of having to flee El Salvador and come to the U.S. in the hope of finding a safer place where I could continue living. And what, what year was that, Oscar, that you got to the U.S.? I arrived to the U.S. in January of 1980, so it's a little more than 40 years now. And most of your, is most of your family here now, or do you still have a significant amount back in El Salvador? Well, my immediate family, as I mentioned, came to be together again by the summer of 1981. We had all come to New York, and we were living together uh, in New York City, uh, the Bronx specifically. And my extended family, most of it also fled El Salvador uh, because of similar circumstances as mine. Uh, but I still have, you know, cousins, distant cousins, uh, aunts, uh, uncles, uh, still there. Uh, but my family today is very much uh, residing in the U.S. Uh, I have basically three pockets of relatives, uh, very large, each of them one in the Los Angeles area, one in the Washington DC area, and one in the New York City metropolitan area. So that's where my family resides today. Again, I still have a few cousins uh, in El Salvador, but clearly the incidents of violence I mentioned, which were actually followed by a civil war uh, that began officially at the end of 1981 and lasted all the way through 1982, uh, made a huge impact in the life of millions of Salvadorians who left uh, the country during those years and continue uh, to leave El Salvador even after uh, the war came to an end in, 1980, in 1992. Can you talk about that civil war and the U.S.'s role in it? Yes. Uh, back then, uh, you may recall uh, that the late 70s were actually the years of the Carter administration an administration that was at least officially committed to embracing, promoting human rights as a central criteria to decide which, which uh, government the U.S. was going to be uh, supportive of. Uh, I remember that, as I mentioned, the sad events that led to my political involvement, the massacre of that student march happened in the summer, July of 1975. By 1977, we already had a very, very dangerous situation, increasingly becoming worse. Labor unions were being literally annihilated. Many peasant uh, communities that were there, daring to organize were also being targeted by police forces in, in the army in El Salvador. And so it became actually an issue in which the U.S. government became involved and somewhat critical of the events in El Salvador. However, that criticism did not last too long. I should point out that there was a particular event that marked a very important shift in the reality of El Salvador, and it was a coup d'etat that was actually launched apparently by young military officers who took over uh, the government from the dictator that we had at the time, a guy by last name Romero. Uh, Humberto Romero, and all appearances suggested that this newly uh, put together de facto government, uh, a military civic junta, was going to actually go in the democratic building direction, only to find out that that was entirely a disguise. And the events that, un that were unleashed following that coup d'etat in October of 1979 were even worse than we had seen before in terms of violence. Interestingly, the United States government decided to resume military aid, political support for the government in El Salvador at the time. I remember that Archbishop Romero, who, as you may recall, was actually a slain while saying mar a mass uh, in March uh, of 1980, he actually pleaded to President Carter to actually stop sending military support and stop sending uh, uh, any aid to the Salvadorian government at the time, precisely because he went against the very idea that the Carter administration had put forward, namely its commitment to a human rights uh, um, standard that clearly the Salvadorian government at the time did not meet. 
From that point forward, as you may recall, there was an election in 1980. Uh, Ronald Reagan was elected president, and Ronald Reagan did not at all disagree with the way the Salvadorian government was behaving. On the contrary, they framed the events in El Salvador as part of an international crusade against communism, when in reality what we had in El Salvador was a revolt that was primarily fueled by people, peasants, students, urban workers, extremely uh, unhappy with the way past governments had behaved and truly wanted to bring about a different kind of government there. Sadly, the U.S. government simply increased its military involvement. It continued to back up uh, the dictatorial regime there. They, of course, I mean, made it look as if it was a democracy. And again, I mean, I could go over the entire 12 years of civil war where the U.S. played a central role providing assistance. At that time, El Salvador became the place in which the U.S. was fueling uh, aid only comparable to the standards that had been established in Vietnam in the 1970s. Talk to me a little bit about the connection between what has happened throughout this period, this counterinsurgency war, the arming of right-wing militias, authoritarian governments, leading all the way up until what now has been portrayed as this sort of immigration crisis in the United States. There's obviously a direct connection to both the economic policies that the United States and the West imposes on Latin America, but also the militaristic policies. Sure. Well, El Salvador, in many ways, is a very interesting laboratory, which has been actually studied, you know, by many people from different political motivations. Uh, but one case uh, in which El Salvador is very much an example is that prior to 1980, the migration by Salvadorians to the U.S. was very, very limited. There were probably a few tens of thousands of Salvadorians in the entire U.S. at the time, uh, the armed conflict that was happening very much with the support of the U.S. government led to the massive fleeing of Salvadorians, hundreds of thousands of Salvadorians like me, uh, who left precisely in that period involving the late uh, 1979 year all the way to uh, the mid-1980s. And that first huge wave, again, was very much related to the counterinsurgency war that was being fought there with very close U.S. advice and support, including, you know, the presence of military advisors very often in the actual uh, ground, uh, contrary to what the U.S. government was saying at the time that the role was simply advising. They were very much engaged in the actual uh, combat uh, scenes and the repression that was being unleashed against especially rural communities, all of which, again, strengthened the tendency for many Salvadorians to see going away as far away as they could, and the U.S. was the place they chose to go uh, for, for their own safety. Interestingly, as the war kept advancing, different initiatives in the field of counterinsurgency only provoke even more people to first uh, migrate to the cities, especially San Salvador, the capital city of El Salvador. But as there were no opportunities for people to find a meaningful way of life there, of course, they began looking at uh, leaving El Salvador, going to the U.S. in particular, not exclusively, because there were also Salvadorians going to Canada and Salvadorians applying for asylum directly with several European countries, which actually grant them uh, asylum uh, to be able to travel as far away as Australia where there is, interestingly, a colony of Salvadorians uh, there. Uh, but to make a long story short, as the war came to an end in 1992, we shifted the dynamics. Instead of battling a counterinsurgency that was designed to essentially attack rural communities as well as urban communities, we moved into a situation where El Salvador became one other example in the implementation of economic policies that emphasize defunding social investment areas of the budget and emphasizing privatization, emphasizing uh, many other things that are essentially what the U.S. government was recommending to the World Bank, to the International Monetary Fund, uh, 
to the Inter-American Development Bank to do in these countries. I mean, they very often refer to all these experiments as the Chile model, which as we all know, is the result of the Chicago Boys experiment in Chile during the years of dictatorship of Pinochet uh, there. And incidentally, these policies, rather than leading to a situation in which Salvadorians who were hoping that at the end of the war, there would finally be peace, there would finally be somewhat of an economic recovery, so much so to actually allow Salvadorians to even come back from outside the country to live again in the country, the opposite is what happened. Opportunities became far less available and more Salvadorians continued to live. This was also combined with policies in the US, specifically in California, uh, policies like the three strikes out uh, that became very popular, uh, basically a punishment driven uh, justice uh, approach by the US, which very soon began to target people who were foreigners, specifically Salvadorians, who came to the U.S. in the 1980s as little kids, became involved with gangs in Los Angeles. These gangs were eventually, literally, exported back to El Salvador, a country that had no knowledge, no capacity to deal with that particular new factor. And in time, over time, this issue became again another reason to continue to push Salvadorians out of the country as gangs became much more in control of territories there, uh, often putting people through all sorts of abuses. Uh, and of course, I mean, extorting money from them. So again, all that simply has led to a never ending uh, dynamic where people has been increasingly having to leave the country. You may recall that as early as 2014, there was a so-called unaccompanied children crisis. Many children from countries like Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador uh, actually were part of this dynamic that I am describing. And again, sadly, it has continued to only become worse, especially as gang violence became notoriously uh, deadly uh, in countries like El Salvador, Honduras, uh, Guatemala, in which Thousands of people have been killed over the past you know, several years. That has led so many people to want to go and find a safe place outside El Salvador. That's why we have seen increasing numbers of people trying to apply for asylum in the US because they surely cannot live in a country like El Salvador. But the same applies I mean, to a country like Honduras and to a lesser degree, Guatemala. In the US, we have painted all this in a very different light. We have painted it as if these people are simply economic migrants, as if to have economic rights, it's some, somehow uh, something wrong. Uh, what's wrong with wanting to put food on the table? But the bottom line is they emphasize these angles simply to say that these people are not deserving of humanitarian protection and they should be sent back. I have to say, I mean, these policies did not begin with Donald Trump. Donald Trump has only made them even worse and far more inhumane than they were ever before. But the motion uh, that I'm talking about was a motion that was actually put in place going back all the way to the mid 1990s, uh, when we had one of the most significant changes in US immigration policy that resulted in essentially making more difficult the life of communities like those Salvadorian, Guatemala, and Hondurans who have been trying to get to the U.S. in hope of finding safe heaven and support. And has that process further militarized in the post 9-11 world? How much different does it look now? You have all of these pretexts against terrorism and drug trafficking. Of course, the war on drugs playing a role as well. But I'm wondering how much more intensely militarized the situation has become in this sort of post 9-11 world that we still find ourselves in. You know, we're still supposedly fighting this war on terror, so on and so on. Well, the problem with the events that were unleashed, you know, by the events of September 11, uh, 2001, is that the country shifted dramatically in a direction in which we were already going in namely a very militarized response to every problem that occurs either at home or abroad. 
but 9-11 only gave far more legitimacy you know to that argument uh, as a result you may recall that immigration functions in the u.s which had been up until then part of the uh, department of justice in the un in the u.s they were transferred into the newly created department of, of homeland security so everything about immigrants and immigration is now run through the department of homeland security that included the way the u.s related to governments abroad not only from a foreign policy perspective but also from the domestic uh, um, a policy uh, perspective specifically as driven by the department of homeland security so the end result over time was that yes we saw a more militarized uh, um, implication in the way the u.s conducted its foreign policy in central american countries the armies became by far you know the allies of uh, greatest trust on the part of the u.s which it don't, ironically, I mean, are exactly the actors that were behind all of the headaches that these societies endure over many, many, many decades. So again, to emphasize at the point today, you know, we have a situation where if you go to Guatemala, Honduras, or El Salvador, you will once again see that the most visible uh, law enforcement body are basically the military or police forces that have been made to look like military. You know, I just saw actually the news last week that the Salvadorian civilian police just announced their new uniforms. And their new uniforms look just like the uniforms that the army soldiers actually wear. I mean, this is only to exemplify that this tendency of greater militarization, greater uh, a military responses, you know, to social economic problems, sadly continues to be present. And what is worse, it continues to make people come to points of desperation where they see no other option for their own uh, survival, for their own well-being, than to actually leave a country like El Salvador. We are seeing a situation that is very hard to predict how it will exactly evolve, because up until about six months ago, the only way Salvadorians could escape the reality of oppression, be that economic, social, or political oppression that they were experiencing, was to actually flee El Salvador. But in the context of COVID-19, all borders have been sealed. You know, Salvadorians are not anymore free to be able to leave a country like El Salvador. The same is true for almost every other country. And yet the circumstances, the conditions that I was describing have not magically disappeared just because there was a pandemic uh, fight being fought, uh, which in the case of El Salvador what has been fought primarily by using the military, which is really ironic because I suspect this will basically place people between a uh, wall and a hard place uh, because they will not be able to find solutions. And I cannot imagine how this will uh, evolve in the context of even greater human rights violations taking place, not anymore at the U.S.-Mexico border or at the border between Mexico and Guatemala, but in our own countries, you know, because governments will try to please Donald Trump in as far as not letting anybody else leave. But on the other hand, there are no alternatives, you know, for people to actually go about living dignified lives. Who are the political actors in El Salvador today? Who are, are the people who are fighting back able to do so above ground? Or are most of the activities that take place below ground? Are there unions in this struggle? Are there student groups? What does this sort of composition of the progressive left look like today in El Salvador? Well, let me, to, or, to, to answer your question, I have to backtrack a little bit. Um, let's remember that the war came to an end as a result of a peace agreement, a peace agreement that meant that the people who became involved in confronting the military dictatorship by pursuing armed struggle and who were never defeated in spite of all the U.S. support provided to the military there, they too, I mean, they and the, the army and the oligarchy on the other hand came to an agreement you know, that allowed the rebel forces that were regarded essentially as left-leaning uh, became a new political party. 
that political party entered into electoral uh, politics in El Salvador in the mid-early uh, 1990s. They were the opposition party, essentially, until uh, the year 2009, when finally they actually won a presidential election. There was a lot of hope uh, that because a left-leaning party was coming into office, that there was some hope uh, for common Salvadorians to actually begin to find answers in El Salvador in as far as their economic, social, political expectations. Uh, sadly, that turned out to be not the case. The left, even though was in government, found itself very incapable of actually governing in a way that would be beneficial for the majority of Salvadorians. And I believe that there were obviously very strong impediments put in the way for that first government to actually make a difference. But I also believe that something really interesting happened. I think that as a left party came into office, they forgot about why they wanted to be in office and simply began replicating the way power was exercised up until the moment they came into office and they sadly began to again engage in acts of corruption, mismanagement that gradually led to people being very dissatisfied uh, with the left. But even five years later, you know, in 2014, people still trusted the left and they re elected uh, the same political party, a different uh, president, but the same political party to continue in office for another five years. Uh, sadly, as I said, I mean, they simply were not able to engage in the kind of political changes that most Salvadorians aspire to see take place. And as a result, a very deep uh, disappointment mood uh, took over. And this involves anybody and everybody, you know, labor unions, student organizations, organizations of poor communities that simply fight for better housing conditions, uh, all of them were basically so, so disappointed that they didn't know what to do because then, you know, we had an election a year and a half ago uh, that people didn't know really who to support because clearly they did not like the right-wing party, a party go that goes by the name of ARENA, uh, which in English would be like National Republican Alliance. This is a party founded in the early 1980s. You can connect the dots uh, between the name they took and the Republican Party in the US. Um, but they did not want the FMLM, which is the left-leaning party, to continue in office because they were so disappointed. So in lack of better options, a relatively newcomer actually ran for president. He had been part of the left party, but had been expelled uh, from the left party a year and a half ago or so before he ran for president. And to make a long story short, he won. He won the presidency, not overwhelmingly. He barely won the elections. I mean, he won about 53 percent uh, of the vote uh, in that election. But what's important to keep in mind is the majority of Salvadorians did not actually vote. So the biggest uh, casualty in that election that resulted in this new person uh, in the presidency were basically people who decided not to vote because they didn't like any of the options on the table. But nonetheless, Najib Bukele, a guy who is the grandson of um, uh, Arab immigrants in El Salvador, more specifically Palestinian immigrants in El Salvador, who had actually been uh, for one term the mayor of San Salvador, the capital city, became the newly elected president of El Salvador out of the elections that took place in February of 2019. Um, he took office on June 1st, and everybody were wondering, you know, what is this guy going to do? Is he going to be uh, committed, you know, to actually finally putting an end to the po politics uh, of division, the economic policies that simply led to more Salvadorians being impoverished, and to make a long story short, I have to say that he is actually in a difficult situation now because the actions that he has undertaken, especially from February until now, have clearly placed him more along the lines of a young dictator 
than a young democratic reformer. And in this respect, most people are still supporting his government. Uh, it is hard to say whether he is left-leaning, right-wing leaning, centrist, because he seems to take actions that would lead you to think that he could be either. And in this respect, I mean, I'm extremely concerned about the immediate future for El Salvador because there is actually another election coming up next year, an election where uh, the Congress will be renewed, mayors will be elected. And this young guy, Nayib Bukele, 38 year old, he is hoping to be able to fill the whole country with people that are loyal to him. And my concern is that rather than innovating in terms of how to provide democratic alternatives for a country like El Salvador, we are going to see more of a slide into all dictatorial practices that frankly, I don't believe will work because then people will begin to protest even more uh, emphatically against this government, something they cannot do right now because of the social uh, isolation policies that are very strongly in place in El Salvador. But there are a lot of people that are very unhappy with the way he has handled, as I said, the fight against COVID-19. The abuses are very obvious. And in this respect, I mean, I, again, fear a lot for the future of El Salvador in the short to medium term. What this issue of governing continues to come up for the left. I mean, we saw this, of course, in 2013, 2014 with Sariza. We've seen this with Podemos in Spain. To a greater or lesser degree, we've seen this in Ecuador. I'm sorry. We've also seen this in Venezuela, Bolivia. Um, different circumstances, different contexts each time. But even as you mentioned, the new president um, in El Salvador, I'm sitting here thinking of a Macron or I'm thinking of Biden. When you say people don't know whether he's left or he's right, sometimes he speaks the language of, say, a small L liberalism, but then acts more like maybe authoritarian or more militaristic. I guess there's two questions here. The first would be, what are your thoughts on this problem of the left governing and being able to govern? And then the second question would be, or maybe even more of just to get your thoughts on, I think a lot of Americans see this as something that's happening in the United States. So people living in the U.S. see this and they say, the two-party system is corrupt. Democrats and Republicans are both bad. We need a system like elsewhere. But elsewhere, we also see problems with the same electoral process. What, what are your thoughts on that and just the difficulties in the left governing? Well, what I can tell you as uh, somebody who was fully seduced by the arguments that were very popular in the 1970s, namely the essential argument was here we are with ruthless capitalism backed by military uh, forces uh, basically ruling. And the only solution to this is a socialist revolution. I mean, that was absolutely inspiring for my generation. You know, the young people that went on to become opponents of that government, either as a political activist, as a political organizer, as I was, or others who decided to actually pursue armed struggle against that government, it was inspiring equally. You know, the proposition that there could be a, a totally radically different form of government to come into place to basically trash everything we had had up until then. I think that those ideas were, again, I mean, extremely uh, powerful, extremely appealing to people in many parts of the world. However, we clash, you know, those ideas with the resolve of the U.S. in particular in our continent uh, to basically crush uh, that kind of revolutionary movement. The Sandinista revolution was perhaps, you know, the last case uh, in that you know, particular trend of armed revolutions sweeping into power. And I think that what happened towards the end of the 1980s, as the Soviet Union fell apart, you know, socialism became basically a joke because it proved not to be able uh, to be sustainable for multiple reasons. Uh, I think that there are very notable exceptions, Cuba being one of them in our own continent. Uh, that has managed to survive uh, incredibly as it is, uh, but they have survived and in many ways actually flourished. Uh, but what remains the fact is, as left governments, 
came into office, a left party, such as I came into office, what I see is an inability, a lack of capacity to really innovate in terms of what does it mean to run the state? You know, what does it, what does it mean to run in a way that is consistent, you know, with the values, consistent with the broad ideas that inspire so many young people to even give their lives, you know, for revolutionary movements, uh, and to really govern in a way that would emphasize the well-being of uh, people who have historically been excluded. And instead, we began to see how corruption, how favoritism, how uh, uh, very often friendships, I mean, they turn to be more powerful than merit uh, in as far as who to appoint for this position, who to appoint for that position. And to make a long story short, I think that the left failed to really strategize as to how they would exercise power once they got there. Instead, they replicated some of the worst practices of the very people they had actually criticized. And again, I'm not at all suggesting that that's all there is to it. Of course, the United States government has actively been working to make sure that these governments become corrupt, that this government right. becomes unsuccessful. That all is true. Right. You know, but I also believe that we have the obligation, anybody who understands the state of economic inequality today, we have the obligation to really look much more deeply and much more creatively as to what exactly is that we are proposing. Not so much what we are criticizing, which is pretty clear, and it merits to be criticized, but we need to also speak both conceptually but practically about what is it that we are for. And I think that in that front, we still have a long way to go because I also see a lot of the so-called left-leaning movements uh, progressive movements, very often to focus on criticizing what we don't like. And most of all, I still see a lack of definition in terms of a clear political organizing strategy that is, in my view, the only way we can really challenge the powers that be, uh, given how powerful they are and how able they are to adapt you know, to new circumstances. I don't know if you see it the same way, but I think there's an interesting contradiction right now in the United States, and we can sort of move into what's happening here in the U.S., and, and I think the reflections you provide from your experiences over the years and the experiences in El Salvador can provide some context and help for people who are organizing today. One of the contradictions I think that are that is clear to me is that maybe 40 or 50 years ago, the left might have had a clearer definition. We could say it was maybe flawed, underdeveloped, or a maybe simplistic idea of what the socialist revolution would look like, but there was an idea of what it would look like, maybe not enough power in the U.S. to make it happen. Whereas today, it seems like the economic, ecological, racial situation, the context in the United States is so much more intense and so much more pronounced. In other words, yes, you had uprisings in 1968, but you still had an economy in 1968 in the United States. Right now, you don't. I mean, there's tens of millions of people just left behind by the neoliberal economic system. Yeah. Today, it seems like there might be the energy. In other words, we see people storming police stations. We see perhaps people taking over government buildings. But we don't know what the hell we're going to do if we get into the government building or what is the vision. And this all gets back to your point. And I think it it's... It's very interesting. It's a contradiction, but it's also, I think, somewhat frightening um, insofar as I think sometimes these movements or our movements, we get a short window of opportunity. And if we misuse that window of opportunity or if we look to be like if the if the United States sees the left taking more and more power, but then nothing changes in people's lives or let's say even worse, things get worse for people it really does significant damage to movements over the long term, which gets back to this need uh, for a conversation around vision and strategy and exactly what it is that we're for and we're trying to create. I mean, do you see some of those same challenges in this context with the uprisings that are taking place? And how are you viewing what's happening today? Some of the, what would your advice be for the people who are in the streets organizing these events, the things that you've seen over the years? You know, something that I have seen in my life uh, in the U.S., uh, especially as we enter the 1990s and, and the 2000s all the way to where we are now, 
is that we, and I mean, you know, not to put it just in a simplistic label of left, but people who are truly concerned with reversing, you know, the nature of this savage capitalism that has become so dominant uh, in the U.S. and abroad, which explains why economic inequality is as rampant as it is. Um, I think we need to understand that a requirement to be able to, to really challenge models of oppression, you know, like the one we have in place in the U.S., is to actually have great clarity about what we want but also great discipline in building organizations that are in just a virtual thing, in organizations that are actually real on the ground, able to coordinate every move, every uh, action they take with others. And that implies, again, I mean, a high level of organization that I am not yet seeing uh, in the US predominantly. And I really believe that there are at least you know three critical issues that if we fail to understand in this particular moment and properly build them into an alternative inspiring vision of what we want and also begin to think of the engineering behind the architectural design because you can have the most beautiful architectural design defined but if you don't have the engineering you know, the know-how of how you actually are going to make it happen, we are equally lost. Right. And so neither one of those two, I see them necessarily well articulated by and large in terms of the actors of movements, including those we have seen in high gear over the last, you know, 10 days or so. And I think that the conditions are, number one, understand the fact that everything about the United States of America has been built from a very clearly defined premise of white supremacy. And that has filtered everything you know, that we have done in the country. Everything that we are about is totally, totally embedded you know, with white supremacy in it. Sometimes it is as brutal as we saw on May 28th in the case of George Floyd, but very often it is much more subtle you know, we just so subtle that we don't even see it. So that's number one. Number two, we need to understand the meaning of class oppression. You know, most people don't even think about class oppression in the US because it's been eradicated from our language, from our frame of mind. We've been well indoctrinated that there is no class differences in the US, which is a big lie. Uh, clearly there is class oppression and you all you need to see is the actual data regarding economic inequality. You can call it in any way you want, but in the end, it's about class oppression. And most Americans usually are not necessarily fully conscious of that. And the third aspect that I think is even less uh, 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 visible to most people is that our very political system, the, the so-called democratic representative democratic system that we have in the country, it's broken, you know, it doesn't work. Especially, this is something obvious for young people, like the people who've been protesting a lot in the past few days. If you are under 20 years old and convinced that we need a revolution, you absolutely understand that voting is not the way to go because they've been studying carefully how election after election, no matter who gets to be elected, nothing changes. This is a conclusion I came to in the mid 1970s in my own country, because we had been told to go vote every five years and nothing changed. It didn't matter who came to office. In our case, it was always the same people who came to office because it was a military dictatorship. But in the US, I believe that those three premises need to be absolutely clear in crafting what is it that we propose and how do we propose to execute an alternative plan to be able to really speak of transformational change as something we may have a chance to bring about. I would like to, I think what we'll do is, if it's okay with you, I would like to have a separate conversation maybe about those three points 
Absolutely. Because I think it would be nice for you to draw those out a little more because I'm sure if those are things that you've just mentioned, you've been thinking and I'm sure have th- oh, yeah. have a lot of ideas of what you would like to say about them. But I'm for the sake of time, sure. I would like to get you to talk about a couple of things before we go. First yeah. would be you mentioned this concept of discipline. Um, you mentioned your experiences in a revolutionary context. I think in the United States... There are people who throw around the term revolution. Uh, There are people who throw around these kinds of concepts, not understanding the sort of organizational or institutional capacity that's needed to wage a revolution on the one hand. And on the other hand, the sort of brutal realities that come from revolutions, wars, civil wars, etc. Can you... I don't know if you're a pacifist or what your views are and those types of things, but and in, in, in that's not really consequential, I guess. I'd, I'm more so your thoughts on what this means for a new generation of Americans who are seeing these institutions collapse around them. They see no hope in the traditional political mechanisms. And this word is being thrown around, I think, maybe even more than left progressive liberal commentators think it is. I mean, if you're in the streets listening to these kids, A lot of them are using this term revolution. They're talking explicitly about capitalism. They're talking explicitly about white supremacy. They're not talking about reforming police. They're talking about dismantling and defunding the police. These are radical ideas. And so, again, the the opinions have shifted quite dramatically in just a short amount of time. But to me, it seems like we're lacking an understanding of what that means because, of course, people living in the United States, for the most part, have not lived in a revolutionary context or in a civil war. And we don't have the organizations necessary to conduct a revolution as it stands right now. What are your, what is your advice to the people who are out there, maybe not understanding the level of discipline, um, the organizational capacity that's necessary to fundamentally change these institutions? Well, first of all, let me clarify that I don't consider myself a pacifist uh, simply because I believe every human being has the right to self-defend uh, and ensure the safety of others. And sometimes in order to do that, you have to resort you know, on violent uh, methods to be able to do that. Uh, but as a matter of principle and as a matter of life experience, I also believe that violence should never be the first option that anybody takes, uh, simply because it's extremely painful, it's extremely costly, And above all, it does something to the individual and the collective soul uh, of peoples that is almost impossible to repair. And so in that respect, I mean, I I definitely believe that we need to become much more, um, how could I put it, uh, not to use just the word discipline, much more practical, you know, in terms of what do we understand the fight to be against, which is, I think is important, you know, to be clear about what are the wrongs that we want to right. But at the same time, we need to be much more clear about what do we hope, you know, we can bring into place. And it is okay to be as uh, much a dreamer as one can be, to be full of utopias, you know, in the way we go about it because utopias and revolutions are actually very closely intertwined. But the problem that I do see, especially in the US, is that we need to understand that the fight that we need to uh, be able to put in place is a fight that requires a level of organization that we have not seen anything even remotely close to ever, you know, in the US. I would say that probably the only time that we came somewhat close to that was when this was still the 13 colonies, you know, and there was a war against a very brutal empire like the British. Uh, And remember, they were not pacifists. They were very much violent actors. I still believe that this proposition of revolution, yes, you know, it goes through the ability to articulate a clear proposition of what we want, but it also needs to be understood that it is not just a systemic a structural change that needs to be brought about. It is also a change within each of us. We need to review our personal beliefs, our personal uh, principle and values uh, uh, drivers, and we need to also look 
at how we relate, you know, to the very systems that are in place. How do I contribute to those uh, place? I mean, systems that are in place. And I think it is imperative that we understand that the change has to be both me changing personally, you know, doing things differently, but also advocating for changes in the actual policies, in the actual structures. I mean, I, for example, do not disagree, you know, with making police forces disappear, but that alone is only one piece of the puzzle. You know, we need to understand that there is a system that actually enables uh, police forces to have become what they are, which is essentially uh, deeply, deeply flawed institutions from a racist point of view, from the class interests that they defend. And we need to be clear about that. So you have to completely reimagine what does a society look like. And from that definition, have the ability to say, how can we speak entirely from a new premise? about what does public security mean? Because public security does not mean at all from an alternative perspective, what most of us tend to agree uh, that gives you know, reasons for a so-called police force uh, to exist. To me, for example, public security means good schools, good housing for everybody, access to healthcare for everybody, access to good jobs, access for leisure time for everybody so that we can enjoy our families, all of that is very much part of what I understand, you know, for a much more people-centered definition of public security. But again, that, that definition is only possible if you dare to imagine a much more ambitious proposition for our entire society and an, our entire world. And again, having the discipline to imagine what is the kind of organization, what is the kind of actions that with discipline, if we were to implement them, make possible, not only to bring the dream about, but to sustain it, uh, because that's the difficult part. Well, Oscar, I think that's about the best place we can leave it today. That's great advice for people. Or if there's any last things you'd like to say, there's going to be people who are watching this just getting involved for the first time. For many of the people we're organizing with in our region, this is maybe their first movement moment. You know, maybe they weren't around during Ferguson or Occupy or the labor movements or the anti-war struggle or even environmental struggles. If you want to, you, you're more than welcome to sort of leave them with any last advice that you'd give to the folks, especially the young folks who are in the streets right now. Well, I think that's something that, that you said earlier that I want to uh, come back to. I think it is important to understand that in the process of bringing about change, you know, something that I learned as a, te a teenager, as a revolutionary situation, uh, they tend to be very rapid in, in going. You have them today, but it may be gone tomorrow. And so the fact that we don't have a very strong organization to actually nourish itself from a moment like this makes it risky. It, but what I would say to especially young people is less think of this as a long-term undertaking. This is not something about tomorrow, but the long haul. Revolution, well done, take time. But we need to have the stamina and we need to have the frame, uh, the, the intellectual frame to nourish, it, nourish us. But we also need to put in place the nuts and bolts of what organizing to bring about revolution really mean. And that means, again, understanding that, yes, this moment may well not be there in a few days, but if we understand the challenge, again, getting ourselves organized, becoming much more capable of planning and executing plans, connecting with others in an organized way, we will have gone a long way. Thank you so much for your time, Oscar. I really appreciate these reflections. They're absolutely essential in this current context. Genuinely, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. You've been watching Park Media. I'm your host, Vince Emanuele, and we will talk to you soon. Hey, thank you for watching and listening. If you think this program is worth a pack of cigarettes or a cheeseburger, you could become a Patreon for as little as $3 a month. The link is available at our website, parkmedia.org. That's P-A-R-C media.org. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel below. Also, you could find us on Instagram at Park Media, Facebook at Politics, Art, Roots, Culture, and you could find me on Twitter at Vince Emanuele.